Welcome to Ohm Times TV, a division of Ohm Times Media and Broadcasting. Welcome to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's live streaming interview series, where leading new thought teachers, speakers, and authors share the intimate stories behind the 10 best spiritual books that inspired them the most on their spiritual journey. From well-known classics to hidden gems you might never have heard of, the No BS Spiritual Book Club saves you time and money by sharing reliable recommendations from those who've walked the path before you. The No BS Spiritual Book Club, the only No BS guide to the best spiritual books to inspire your own journey of self-discovery. Here's your host, founder of the No BS Spiritual Book Club, Sandy Sedgbeer. Hello, joining us this week to share the 10 best spiritual books that inspired him the most on his life journey is internationally renowned religious scholar, teacher of mysticism, and prolific author, Andrew Harvey. Andrew is the subject of the BBC documentary, The Making of a Modern Mystic, and the founder and director of the Institute for Sacred Activism, an international organization focused on inviting concerned people, that's us, to take up the challenge of our contemporary global crises by becoming inspired, effective and practical agents of institutional and system change. Andrew's latest book, Regeneration, Sacred, sorry, uh, Radical Regeneration. Radical Regeneration. Radical, yes, we mustn't forget the radical, and it is radical. (laughs) Radical Regeneration, Sacred Activism and the Renewal of the World is the book that we all need to be reading at this very time. So, Andrew, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. What a delight to be with you again. And what a wonderful program. I think it's so exciting to be asked what 10 books have thrilled you and helped you and to be able to help others get to books which they might not have heard of. How marvellous. What a wild and wonderful idea. I just bow to it. Thank you. It's also, I'm told by the guests, uh, a very interesting exercise. I mean, did you find Mm -hmm. going back over the books that inspired you was a little bit like having a life review? Oh, my God, it is. Yes. It's a very profound exercise because these books that I've chosen, and I'm sure all your other guests have chosen, are books that really infused me with new vision and spirit and courage, and I know that we'll deeply, deeply help others. So how exciting. Do you recall the first book 
that really lit a fire in you. Yes, I do. It was Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. Really? I read it at 12. I didn't really understand it. I just knew I was in the presence of something overwhelmingly majestic and terrible and amazing. And I completely identified with Heathcliff and Cathy and their desperate love. And I knew that part of the world had been there once, so I knew how wild it was. So it was an explosion on many levels reading that book. And I yeah. never stopped loving Emily Bronte. I think she's one of the greatest. Yes, indeed. Of all indeed. our writers. I went to the house itself where she'd lived and I went to her room. And if you go to Haworth where they all lived, it's absolutely amazing because it's so small. Mm -hmm. And these three towering geniuses were living in this space and they all died young. Yeah. Yes. And tragically, so the house is very powerful. Yeah, it makes you wonder, how does that happen? You know, where do they come from? How can, how can you explain it? I mean, I think constantly of people like Mozart, for example, just appearing yeah. really literally out of nowhere. As a child, fabulously gifted, his first compositions at five, dying at 36, having completely transformed music. Yes. The genius that nobody can account for. This... This is one of the ways in which God plays wonderful games with us by giving yeah. us these astounding beings that can help us forward. Yeah, absolutely. So um, w what was the first spiritual book, um, inspirational in that sense, that you read, you remember? Oh, I do. I do. To be absolutely honest, I've always been completely in love with Jesus. So as a kid, I was a singer. I, was a, I had a treble voice and I sang in the choir. And everything that was ever read from the Gospels about Jesus was as if it was being read for me because I, he was my guy. I believed in everything. I loved his nature, his passion, his beauty, his courage. So the Gospels and his presence, his, his acute, human, loving, passionate presence, which is so different from the presence of all of the other teachers. That got to me very, very early. How, um, how difficult was you it? You want to know what my favorite, I, there was one particular passage that I adored more than anything else. And I, I really knew the Bible and prayer book off by heart. I, it was, um, Regard the lilies of the field, they toil not, neither do they spend. Yet I tell you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed as one of these. And I used to wonder about the school saying that last phrase because it's so beautiful for a poet that is, that has everything, grandeur of words and this amazing rhythm. I tell you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed as one of these. And he's pointed to a wildflower. And I just thought that was the most beautiful thing I had ever heard. It made me drunk every time I recited it to myself. So tell me what it the used process, to make me drunk, yes. What was the process like for you having to pick 10 books? I mean, did you have a particular um, process, a criteria? What I wanted to do is just to represent different sides of my own passion and different ways in which that passion had been so helped by the noble and heroic and wonderful and astonishingly brave efforts of other people. Because I think that's also important. It's not simply that books give you information. Books can also teach you how to write, teach you how to be, teach you give you a whole new vision of the world you're in yeah. and empower you at the most extraordinary levels. They are divine tools. And there's a special way of reading, which I strongly commend to everybody. It's called Lectio Divina in the old world, divine reading. But if you are excited by any of the books that I'm going to suggest, read them slowly. These are books composed by real masters, 
beings who have gone into deep solitude, found great truths, worked with the full intensity of their whole self to make what they have to say as available and as thrilling to us and as empowering to us. But it demands of us a kind of reverence and a kind of commitment to really take the book seriously at the deepest level as a very profound conversation to have a have a listening as deep as the conversation that the person who wrote the book is trying to have with us it's a wonderful it's an amazing feeling when you really fall in love with a writer as yes. a soul and that writer's soul then becomes part of your own soul because mm. once you've fallen in love with another soul that love incorporates the wisdom and the depth of that soul into your soul so you feel expanded and mm, indeed yeah don't you find that oh absolutely i mean there are times when you and you get such such a, a feeling for the right yes you know you almost understand them because yes the way that they write the words that they use you know the poetry the just the way they put it all together is something that gives you a deep insight into who they are. Absolutely. They become your friends. They become your sacred friends. Friends yes. of yes. Which, on nights alone when you are feeling doubtful and battered and paralyzed, you take their work and you read for half an hour and after it you, you want to dance because you've met a, a robust, spirit that nothing has defeated yeah. and has brought all of these gorgeous things to bear and yeah yeah they really do they, they light a flame within you oh, they do God. for me yes. yeah yeah <laughs> without the great ones where would we be without the amazing way shows yeah where yeah. would we be so our first book on your list is merchants of light the consciousness that is changing the world by betty kovacs and this was published just a couple of years ago, 2019. Well, this is a completely fabulous book. I beg you all to read it. Merchants of Light is written by one of the wisest women alive. She's in her late 80s. She's been a Jungian analyst. She's written a very extraordinary book on death, which was composed after the death of her son and her husband, both in traffic accidents and in a way that revealed to her that death isn't real which is an astonishing book but her real masterpiece which she spent 20 years on is this book merchants of light and what it does is something absolutely thrilling it looks at the groups of illumined people that appear at very important moments of human history in in India, in at the end of the whole shamanic experiment in Jerusalem, in the Renaissance, in the Romantic era, in our era. And she shows how there's always been on the earth at these amazing moments, people who are trying to midwife the birth of a new humanity, who know the great secret that we're destined to be divine and have a new world, a new life, a new possibility. And who unfortunately again and again have been stopped and thwarted by conventional religion and the kind of reaction that their radical messages of good news aroused in people. So one of the thrilling parts about the book is that not only is it a marvelous explanation of all of these times when this has been tried, it's also a kind of manual for us what not to do, because this time we really have to be the cohort of light, the people bringing through the new. We can't afford to, to lose this time, because if we do, no world. But of course, if we learn from the practice of the past, as so beautifully expressed by her, then we have an amazing chance of bringing the new message of a unified force field, a unified humanity, a new body, a new creation to humanity. The old ancient message, but now more necessary than ever. Mm. Well, then, book two follows on from that, the dream of the cosmos, because exactly. isn't that what this we are? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the reasons why I chose two women at the, I think I chose four women to begin, is that to honour the great 
extraordinary discoveries, ecstatic discoveries being made by great women mystic intellectuals at this moment. There, I, I don't know why it is. I think it's a particular blessing of the divine feminine, but it's also a manifestation of the immense power of the authentic feminine divine inspired intellect. So you have in Betty Kovacs, you have somebody who is an inspired psychologist, an inspired mother and woman, an inspired mystic and an inspired writer, bringing all of these perspectives together. And in Anne Bering, you have exactly the same thing. Someone who is an intellectual at the highest level, again, a Jungian analyst, a, a great mystic who's gone on a very long and profound journey into the Divine Mother. And in The Dream of the Cosmos, which is another masterpiece that took her 20 years to write, just as Betty had spent 20 years on her work. She brings together the wisdom of the ages as sift through modern science and also the deepest discoveries of transpersonal psychology to give us a sense of where we are, the crisis that is facing us that we've created, but also of what we can draw on for the complete transformation of our crisis so as to fulfill the dream of the cosmos and the dream of the cosmos is for us to live on a sane and just and harmonious earth together in a deep knowledge of our essential divine identity so both betty and and anne are speaking of this tremendous adventure to bring the truth of who, what humanity is out and both of them are great Ag uh, diagnosticians of our crisis, but both of them are offering these fabulously rich sources of wisdom and understanding to help us at our most critical evolutionary moment, which is now. <laughs> now, yes. And didn't Anne um, write the foreword to Betty's book? She wrote the foreword to Betty's book. Anne and I have done two books before in 20, 20 years ago called um, The Mystic diary a mystic tradition and also we did one on the sacred feminine we've been great friends she wrote an astonishing book on the goddess she's one of the major spiritual intellectuals on the divine feminine she wrote a book called the myth of the goddess which is the great book on how the goddess was suppressed by the patriarchy and is now re-emerging and it's her, the vision of that book infuses the great vision that Anne lays out in Dream of the Cosmos, which is, like Betty's book, an absolute unique masterpiece written by an illumined woman, because this is the age of the return of the mother, of the return of the divine feminine, and all of my life is a is a service to that. So I'm, I want to honor those two women who have given me so much and have helped me expand my vision of what the age is, the vision that I've been giving in Radical Regeneration. So these are my two mothers in that vision. We have to try and get them on this show. You must. Oh, they're both utterly wonderful and you'd love them. And everybody here would love them because they're both in their 80s and I feel... I feel old when I'm with them because their energy and their mission, yeah. their sense of what they've been born to do is so moving. These are very great books. Treat, treat yourself to them. Mm. Please. Well, book three, a, a lovely, lovely book, Wild Mercy, Living the Fierce and Tender Wisdom of the Women Mystics by Mirabai Star. And that also was published in 2019. Mirabai is a dear friend, and she's a friend of yours, I know. And I happen to have taught a lot with her and to love her and have a tremendous respect for her. She's very grounded, very wise, very exalted, very skilled, and she's a marvelous writer. And Wild Mercy is the perfect book, I think, for every woman especially to read, but every man too, because it opens you up to the whole range of the sacred feminine. The return of the sacred feminine is the most important part of our whole journey now on the earth. Yes. And Mirabai is one of the great living advocates of the sacred feminine. And in this book, she plunges in to both the beautiful sides and the terrible sides and shows how over time you can evolve a relationship of humility and trust and joy with both of those sides, realizing that they're both sacred and both holy, wild mercy.
Mercy. Sometimes mercy comes, as we know from the times we're living in, in very ferocious ways. And Mirabai is particularly moving in this memoir, I think, because she opens up her own life yes. and the frightening and difficult things that have happened up to her in her own life and shows how this knowledge that was given to her through what she suffered helped her come into a deeper and deeper relationship with the mother. So I put that there because I love Mirabai and I think it's such a marvelously written book, but also because it's such a wonderful book for helping all human beings relate to the mystery of the long forgotten mother, the mystery that is the simplest thing of all. She's right now, right here, everything is her. But it, it takes a lot to be able to wake up to the fullness of what that really means. And God, Mirabai is a wonderful guide to that fullness. Indeed, she is. Book four, Anatomy of the Spirit, The Seven Stages of Power and Healing, Caroline Mace. This comes up quite a few times. On oh, it's, it's, yeah. Caroline is my greatest friend. She lives about five, mi five minutes from me, where I'm sitting right now. So we see each other every day, and I've, we've been very, very close friends for 15 years. But before we met, I was on a flight to San Francisco and went to a uh, I was going to catch it and went to a bookstore and saw this book, Anatomy of the Spirit. I hadn't heard about Carolyn Mace and started to read it and actually almost passed out because it was so amazing. It was one of those strikes of lightning. And Carolyn has described to me how it came to her in a download. It was very much something that arrived from another dimension for her to give. And you can feel it when you're reading the book. Because in this book, Carolyn Mace really is one of the greatest living teachers and also somebody who initiated energy medicine, opened up the whole of medical intuition and energy medicine. Mm. Yeah. What Carolyn does is to marry her increasing wisdom about the energy of the body and how the body expresses itself. And through to the chakra system, the seven chakras that we're born with, to the sacraments, the system of the sacraments in Christian mysticism, as she shows in a way that's absolutely blindingly brilliant how they're interconnected and how if you're aware of how these shifts of intuition and energy can help you open your chakras and then guide you to sacraments that enable you to experience the world as totally sacred, your whole life can be changed. And the Anatomy of the Spirit is one of those life-changing books for, I think, millions of people. It was her first big book. Mm. Millions, millions were gobsmacked by it, as, as they should be. It's still something that is charged with grace. It's an amazing revelation, I think. How did you meet her? I met her because she invited me to go and speak at her, um, at her institute, and I turned up and we immediately became the greatest of friends. I met her mother first, which was Dolores is one of the great ladies of the planet, very robust and wonderful and passionate. And, and Car then Carolyn and I became extremely close. And it's been an amazing friendship, very transformative for me. So I couldn't possibly have any of my 10 favorite books without Anatomy of the Spirit, which I tremendously admire and recommend yeah. to everybody. So book five, The Coming of the Cosmic Christ, The Healing of Mother Earth and the Birth of a Global Renaissance by Matthew Fox, who also has been on this show. Um, yeah. lo love that man. Love that oh, man. Oh, good choice. <laughs> <laughs> mm, what, what can I possibly say about Matt? Matt is, mm. let's all just say it, he is the greatest living Christian mystic. He's the greatest yes. living Christian mystical theologian. His work has been dedicated with heroic scholarship and passion to the complete rehauling of the way in which Christian mysticism is taught and the whole understanding of the Christ consciousness is propagated. What he's done basically is to say, look, this obsession with sin and body hatred and sex hatred is a patriarchal invention. It has nothing whatever to do with the essential message, which is a message of absolute goodness at the core of creation and absolute blessing of the creation and absolute blessing of the body and of sexuality. And this revelation he calls the cosmic Christ, the real embodied divine 
presence that is absolute love. And in this great book, which was a revolution when it came out, The Coming of the Cosmic Christ, he makes clear that the reclamation of this vision, which he shows running through the great Christian mystics like Hildegard and Eckhart and Hadovich and Teresa, is the vision the world needs to be rejuvenated by. And when I read it, it changed my understanding of Jesus and brought me back to Jesus. I loved him, as I said. But the rubbish that I'd encountered in churches and in many of the books on Christianity that I'd read just made my heart sink. But when I read Matthew, I thought, oh, my God, here is the authentic Christ consciousness. And it's linked in the way he speaks of it to all of the other great revelations about mystical consciousness. Mm. So it makes it utterly authentic for me. Yeah. Couldn't have yeah. a greater introduction to authentic Christian mysticism. It's wonderful. Mm. Yeah, and what a life he's led. Yes, <laughs> and continues to lead. He is, yes. I win him often, and we have wonderful talks, and the energy of devotion and passionate work that comes from him is so moving. Yeah. He never stops to pour her, himself out to help others and to really bring the treasures that he's been given to everyone else. And this book is a a real mine of mystical treasure and will change your understanding of the real Christ adventure mm. 180 degrees. <laughs> well, we're going to take, we're halfway through the list. So we're going to take a, a brief break and we'll be back with the last five books on Andrew Harvey's 10 best list after this short break. Stay tuned. Om Times TV. Maya Angelou once said that there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and when I'm not hosting Omtimes Media's flagship radio show, What Is Going On, and the No BS Spiritual Book Club, I help people share their untold stories. Books are my life, my joy, and my passion, and there is no greater reward than helping aspiring writers get their books out of their heads and into the hands of those who are waiting to read them. If you feel that you have a book in you, but don't know where to begin, visit sedgebeer.com. Click on the Work With Me tab and find out how my experience helping others tell their stories might be just what you've been looking for. That's sedgebeer.com, S-E-D-G-B-E-E-R.com. Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself. Invest in your brand and then manifest your success with a robust spheric approach. Ohm Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Ohm Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Ohm Times magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Ohm Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Ohm Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Ohm Times. Open yourself to the possibilities. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Welcome back. Andrew Harvey, British-born Benedictine monk, Father Bede Griffiths, was a oh. very important influence on your life. So it's no surprise that you've chosen uh, the One Light, Reed one Griffiths' light. principal writings as book number six. Oh, I wish we had an hour, but let me just try and convey to everybody listening something. Father Bede, who died in 93, was the greatest 
Christian mystic of the 20th century, he, with Thomas Merton. And I had the incredible privilege to meet him and to do a film about him and also to become his disciple, his beloved, and to live my whole life in his grace because for me, he's not dead. What was completely astonishing about him was that he was open to all the major revelations, to Hinduism and Buddhism and Taoism. He wasn't at all trapped in dogma. And the other thing that was totally amazing about him was that he was actually, at the end of his life, going through a transfiguration process. He was consciously being born into the next level of human evolution. One of the great secrets about the Christian tradition is that they've always been people who were in, so in love with the Christ that they allowed their whole being to be infused by the light of the resurrection so that their whole being was resurrected. And many of them died and were dug up and found that their bodies were completely intact because their whole bodies mm -hmm. had been transformed by this. And this is the great secret at the core of the tradition. This is the real secret of the birth of a new kind of human. That's what Jesus came to do, not to found some religion, but to give us a a path to birthing us into divine humanity. Bede was on that path, and the one light is a collection of his absolutely lucid, brilliant, wonderful, extraordinarily wise writings over a lifetime, and especially a lot of the later writings when he was coming into this tremendous vision of transfiguration. So for me, it's like Holy Scripture. How does one cope with the loss of somebody who has had such an enormous impact on you? Well, the only way to deal with it is to understand that he is more present out of his body than he was in his body, that he's now with me every single moment. So. That was the revelation beyond revelation that came after his death. I was I actually received news of his death in the place where I initially met him in California and I went down to the sea and I was crying. And the sun came up and a sliver of sun went straight across the water and lit me up and I heard his voice. And he said, don't cry, I am with you always. I'm one of the rays of the eternal sun. I love you, I will be with you always to the end of your journey in this or any other world. There is no death. So that was what's, what turned grief into unbelievable gratitude. And for me, he's with me all the time. So no loss. <laughs> Good. I'm glad to hear that. And also, I am in awe of a relationship like that. Well, I am too, actually, quite honestly, because what he has given me can, can't really be put into any words, and not any words that I have. He gave me the vision of divine humanity. He gave me the vision of the true Christ. He gave me the map of what we're going through. Everything he prophesied is coming exactly true. He saw, he knew, because he was at that level of prophetic truth. And he taught me about love, about what true love is. And what true love is, total adoration of another being, because they're so lit up with love themselves, that all you can do is absolutely adore them and be adored back by them so that they could show you that what you're seeing in them they're also seeing in you and that you're not um, inferior you are a beloved of the beloved and i learned so much about jesus from him because that's how jesus was you know jesus hung out with people jesus didn't suddenly appear and say i am the son of god and listen to every word i say that's also boring patriarchal garbage. He was living with people, communicating with people, loving people, being loved back by people, as a friend, as a buddy, as a brother, as a as a lover, Mary Magdalene. So I learned more than I can ever express. And it goes on and on too, because I know that he's inside me, teaching me, helping me, 
shape. <laughs> How can I put things into words? They have... Exactly, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah, but yeah. so many people experience these things and dare not and dare not say them, but because they we live in such a scientifically you know stunted culture. But the truth is that if you want the truth, my friends, the truth is this the truth is that all of the great spirits, all of the great shamans and sages are here. They they didn't go anywhere. Their spirit, their mind, their wisdom is here for us. And when you approach them with reverence, they appear to you, they appear in you. You have a direct naked relationship with messages messengers of eternity. That's amazing. It is. It is. Mm. Book number seven, The Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. <laughs> but that was I a sick way. Oh. Nikilanda. Nikilananda. <laughs> oh, God. This book, everyone, if I could give a book to every single human being to just this would be it. read, it would be this one because the Gospel of Ramakrishna is the account of unbelievable conversations with this great major pioneering saint of the 19th century, Ramakrishna, who was born a Hindu, but broke through into universal mysticism, said amazing things. He said, the mother cooks the food in different ways. So why are you quarreling, you Hindus and you Buddhists and you, it's all one mother, all one light, different cuisine, same food, get with it. And he broke into this territory of universal love, universal knowledge himself in a very wild and beautiful and holy and lonely adventure that he took in his country of Bengal and Dakshineshwar where he lived. But what was so amazing about him was that he spoke very eloquently and simply and beautifully to his disciples about the greatest imaginable truths and about the greatest imaginable secrets. And thank God there was one of them, a doctor who was very grounded and would take all of this amazing stuff and write it up. So we come into the company, the living, wild, holy company of somebody utterly aflame with love of God and saying the most brilliant things, which when you get them, change your understanding of reality forever. And he becomes your beloved friend, amazing friend. It's one, it's the greatest spiritual book ever written because there's nothing like it. There's no other book that takes you into the company of a living, ecstatic, enlightened being, utterly outside the box, utterly lovable, and utterly incredibly brilliant and wise, and speaking from direct knowledge in these amazing stories and images and formulations which just make everything so much easier because he from total knowledge he can be totally clear and that can help you become clear sorry i'm a huge lover of ramakrishna he's been at the core of my own love of the mother i, I was because i read a biography of him by underwood that i realized oh my god not to see and feel and know and love God as mother is a catastrophe, is to miss out a whole dimension, this dimension of the divine experiment. And it was Ramakrishna that gave me that and so much more. Mm. So I just want everybody to meet him. Well, absolutely. And also, um, you know, it's lovely to see you be so passionate and expressive because that's exactly what we want these books to do. Well, they do. <laughs> they do. These are all, uh, I chose nuclear books that will irradiate your whole being because these are books written by awake people, awake mm. people who want to awaken. They don't, they don't have an agenda. They have a passion that yes. can communicate itself to you and give you what you need. And what we need is direct understanding as far as we can of the great mystical overview of what we are and the universe and the crisis we're living in. And we can have it. It's available to us. We're not thrown into the garbage pit of history without some real help, some real ropes of gold being thrown to us. And these books are ropes of gold. Mm, clearly. 
So number eight, this is definitely, uh, yeah, a rope of gold, the Bhagavad Gita. Which version is your favorite? Because there are so many different versions. Oh, I love so many of the versions, but I think the most beautiful one is the, be the version by Yaswaran, E-A-S-W-A-R-A-N. He was uh, he knew Sanskrit, and he was a very fine translator himself, and a, and a mystic, a true mystic. Well, my friends, the Gita has been the manual for an entire civilization for two thousand five hundred years, and I mean the manual the manual for how to live your life. And to me, it is the great manual because, first of all, the Gita comes out of a, of a very ferocious real situation. A man called Arjuna is facing his own relatives in a battle that he doesn't want to fight because he doesn't want to have to kill the very relatives he loves, but who have also betrayed this sacred law, the Dharma, and in the middle of his torment, God appears to him as his own charioteer, Krishna, and gives him the most astonishing transmission of truth. Basically, he says to him, it's already been ordained that they're going to be defeated. You have to live out your essential mission. You cannot escape it. And the way to achieve peace is to concentrate on me and offer up all the rewards of your work to me. Don't worry about results. Just do the work that has been given you to do in as an act of great devotion to me, and I will save you. And that tremendous message is the greatest message about action, I think, ever given humanity. And we need to really listen to it at this moment because we need to rise and we need to act. But we need to act as Arjuna acted from the depths of divine trust, from the depths of surrender, from the depths, too, of our giving up of the results of action. And if we can act like that for the sheer beauty of acting for justice and beauty's sake, then we'll be free free from the terrible anxiety that longing to see your actions achieve immediate results creates. It gives you peace in the middle of action, it gives you serenity in the middle of the storm. And the Gita is the greatest compendium of how to live that peace in action. Mm. Do you read it over and over? Do you go back I do. I read it. Um, I read certain passages I read over and over, and, and I read it throughout, usually once or twice a year, because I think if, as you grow older and as the situation grows more intricate and more painful, difficult, the Gita's words become more and more austere and challenging and truthful. They, it's not... They didn't live in some happy, clappy little world. They lived in a very dangerous world like we did. And I don't think there's any kind of pain or suffering that the author of the Gita would not have understood. But that's what makes his message of this tremendous peace being open to those who serve love and are humble and love the divine and love people and work with tender compassion in the world selflessly. That is such a divine message for the whole of humanity, whatever path you're on. And nobody, and it's never been said more beautifully than it is in the Gita, because Krishna speaks with such unbelievable, calm, naked, pure directness. He's speaking as truth itself. So you feel that truth. Yes, you do indeed feel truth. Number nine, the Goddess Speaks, Poems of <laughs> Ecstasy and Transfiguration by Dorothy Walters, published in 2020. Uh, Dorothy Walters is now in her 90s, and I met her um, 30 years ago. She came to classes of mine in 
San Francisco. And she came after one of her classes and said she'd written some poems and would I read them? And my heart up to be quite honest, totally sank because I cannot tell you how many dreadful poems I've read in the last 40 years. And I admire anybody who tries to write poetry. It's very difficult, but let's get real about some of them have been truly awful. And so I was polite because I'm British and I said, yes, yes, yes. Well, I went into my room and started to read them and I, the top of my head came off. I realized I was in the presence of a, of a truly great mystical poet. And I went, I saw her the next week and I said, Dorothy, you have got to write these poems out of yourself. You are really an amazing channel of divine knowledge. And she'd never thought of writing a book of poems. Well, now she's written, I think, eight books of poems. She's become the m most famous living mystical poet, and she continues to be my beloved friend. So I'm immensely proud of her. And this book, The Goddess Speaks, was written in her late 80s, when she was oh, a young 89. And it's really a book that expresses what has happened to her, which is that 40 years ago, she was woken up by a massive kundalini experience when she was a university teacher in Kansas, the real Dorothy of Kansas. And over the years, her entire being has been permeated by the great electric mother force that the kundalini erupted in her. And now she's speaking as the goddess in her quite normally and simply and with unbelievable eloquence. So she's speaking out of the next level of our potential evolution about what you feel when bliss is living inside you and you're possessed by the divine mother, not only in your mind and heart, but in the cells of your body that continue to grow more and more ecstatic. And that's what this book is about, because I'm convinced, as you know from my book, Radical Regeneration, that we're in an evolutionary mutation, and it's an evolutionary mutation as big, if not bigger, than the one that took place between the um, higher apes and ourselves. We are now the higher apes of our next iteration, and the next iteration is what you find in the books that I've given, because every, each one of these beings knows something about that coming new human. And God, Dorothy is the poet of that birth. So please explore her work. We've done several videos together. You'll be able to see her absolutely lovely magnetic personality, Dorothy Walters. But most of all, get to her work. Her work is simple, naked, timeless, astounding, utterly real, utterly authentic, and springing from a realization I think everyone needs to get in alignment with because it's happening. This Kundalini epidemic that's happening, Dorothy, when Dorothy started, only a few people had had oh, Kundalini experience or, or knew about it. There were very few books about it. And when she started, she had no idea what it was that was going on. Eventually she found out and of course it started to teach her itself the experience. But now there are hundreds of thousands of, of people on different websites who are waking up because this is happening all over the world to wake human beings up. The mother is intervening directly to open the channel of radical revolutionary new concept through the Kundalini explosion. And she's, I've had them and many people have had them and they, they change everything because you realize just how literal the presence of the divine force and how powerful it is in opening up wholly new realms of consciousness. Dorothy is the greatest living expert on the Kundalini and the greatest living voice of what is created in the fire of the Kundalini. It's the fire of the Kundalini singing. It's worth hearing that music. Okay, the last book on your list is on Hinduism by one of the greatest and most original scholars of Hinduism, Wendy Doniger. I just put that in just to be naughty because it's such a wild, huge, gorgeous book. It's such a manifestation of the greatest scholarship. But I guess she. How so? Well, she, in the best way, Wendy O'Donoghue is a questing feminine 
Paul was sick of all the old patriarchal explanations for Hinduism. You know, the boys' club has endlessly repeated the same old truths. And here comes Wendy, who's as erudite as anybody, as skilled in Sanskrit as anyone, the one of the greatest living scholars who says a lot of the stuff that you've been parroting about Hinduism just isn't true. So get with the real picture. And the real picture turns out to be so much more interesting. The real picture turns out to be something that I think is really important for the new universal mysticism that's being born. Because we're not going to have, we can't possibly have some boring universal mysticism that is just another religion in name. That will just drive everybody mad and then we'll have the same old garbage and everybody shouting at each other and saying, my version is better than your version and all of the rest of it. That is pathetic. We can't do that. What we can do is to mimic the gorgeous ordered chaos of Hinduism and have many, many, many different ways of approaching the mystery. And that's one of the great strengths of this book, is she shows how Hinduism is really not any religion, but a way. And that there, to take that way, that sanatana dharma, that way into realizing who you are and what the world is, you can take whatever path you truly want that truly resonates with you so some will take the path of imageless meditation because that's what they're best at and that's what they're most aligned with some will take the path of wild devotion some will take the path of very austere exercises some will take the path of karma yoga dedicating all your actions to god as a prayer to god some will take all of those paths all together Choose which way of relating to the mystery means the most to you and get on with it. Have tremendous joy. I love that. I think Hinduism has, has been in some ways the wisest of all of the religions and that it, in its wisdom, it's remained very polyvalent, very diverse. And we need to, at this moment, where the temptation on so many levels is to go to a fake uniformity, let's keep that gorgeous chaos alive and listen to all of the different approaches because they all could contain truths that we need to be transformed by. Well, that is your 10 best list. Now let's talk about you. And I specifically want to talk about your latest book, um, which... It's an incredible book and really does lay it all out there, you know, where we're at, why we're here, where we go from here and a pathway that takes us there. The book is Radical Regeneration, Sacred Activism and the Renewal of the World. Tell us in your own words why we should all read this book. Well, my tender invitation to you all is this. This is a book that's created by two people, me and Carolyn Baker. Yes. We have been writing now for 30 or 40 years about this evolutionary crisis. We have been at the forefront of those warning humanity that something truly terrifying was coming that demanded our deepest resources, inner and outer, and for years we were treated as marginalized, but now that everything that we have been saying for 30 years is coming true, people are realizing that the work that we have done has been authentic preparation for the human race to go through its defining evolutionary crisis. And we came together because we respect each other's work and know what we're up to, what we're doing, because we're doing the same thing in different ways. We decided that what we would like to do if we could before we died was to give humanity a complete distillation of everything that we had learned on our journey, because we know how absolutely central it has been for keeping us sane and joyful and and energetic and passionate about our work but and the work of changing the world but we also know that humanity is now about to go through the eye of this great evolutionary storm and needs a clear map several clear 
maps. And that is what we have given from our lifetime's experience. We've given you clear maps of the dark night process that have never been given before, that are taken from the deepest mystical traditions mm -hmm. from our own experience. We've given you maps of the process of the birth into the next level of divine humanity, the secret dream of this great evolutionary process, as all the great evolutionary mystics know. We've given you the maps for that. We've given you multiple maps with multiple tools with multiple ways of seeing this crisis and understanding why it's here. So you can have in the backpack of your soul everything that we have to offer you at this moment when everything is at stake and everything is still possible. So that's why I would tenderly invite you to read the book because there is really no other book that I know like it very inspired by the Merchants of Light and Dream of the Cosmos. But what we've tried to do is to make it into a practical, mystical, sacred activist manual for every human being. Not just give the vision, but give the how to yes. get with the vision and to really see and understand it as far as we can so that we can increasingly embody its potential of joy and power and radical transformation of all the ways we live so how can we become sacred activists i think a lot of people are already without knowing it and i think if you are acting in different ways out of deep compassion and deep natural sympathy with animals or with human beings or with nature you're already beginning to be a sacred activist so don't think sacred activism is something very grand and and inaccessible to you. It's something that actually is, I believe, the most natural part of our nature. I think that in almost everybody, there is an impulse to help born out of compassion. And that impulse to help is sacred. But I think if on a larger level, as an answer to your question, I think the most important thing is to realize we have to become sacred activists. If we don't, there'll be no world. If we don't rise up calmly, non-violently, but strongly to say that we want climate change to be respected and major structural changes to be put into operation, we will die out. We can't afford not to be sacred activists. And when you get just how bad the situation is, but also how powerful you can be when you join together with other people who will not just lie down and let the world end at the hand of lunatics, but will want to really rise up calmly and say, there's another way we can do it together and we will do it together. So if you want to find out what the cause is that truly you might dedicate some of your deep resources and your deep time to just ask yourself one question. What of all the things happening out there, and God knows there is a whole slew of lunacy happening, mm -hmm. what of all of those things breaks my heart the most? What truly, truly makes me want to howl with pain and rage? And it could be different for everybody. I, I know that you're all wise and kind people, so you'll be very concerned for a whole slew of different things. But if you really ask yourself that question, something will become so unbearable to you. You'll realize that you hardly can stand thinking about it because it's so unbearable to you. And that is the cause that you're called to address. Because once you get close to that pain and go deep into it and allow it to be there, you'll discover something wild in yourself that says, I cannot bear for this to continue to go on. Yeah. And then you start to work from your heart with others to help. My, my wake up was, was animal rights i just i feel very deeply about many things but what i can hardly even bear to watch the animal um advertisements on tv because the horror that we're inflicting on animals is personal to me it's, it's something that i can hardly stand but that's why I, my personal activism is animal rights advocacy and supporting animal centers and trying to wake up people to the glory of animal consciousness so that we stop the genocide, stop the concentration camp, killing them all. Yeah. Mm. I hope
hope that was a practical answer. Was it a practical? It was indeed. Absolutely. I can't think of a better way to get people to get to the heart of whatever it is that is going to make them, you know, act. Right. And it, it has to be something you care about. And I think a lot of people are frightened about caring, frightened of caring, because I think they know that if you care, it, you're going to get overwhelmed by what's happening. Got to do something. Right, yeah. you've got to do something, and you've got to be one of those people who yeah. just is annoying and steps up and says, this has got to stop. You can't anymore pretend that you don't feel it. And that's why I, I go. I always say to people, risk finding out what truly breaks your heart, because yeah. if you do, you'd be given such energy to do something on behalf of them. It'll never run dry the energy, because the problem will, will need all of your energy. Well, I want to end this show on a, a really high note, and the best way I know how to do that is to say that at a moment of profound sadness regarding the state of the world, you were given a message that changed your life. Tell us what that message was, because that's the high note that we need to end on. Well, the message really was serve the growing Christ, serve what's trying to happen. The whole point of my book is that this death process we're in is actually a birth process. And it's the birth of a new humanity, a divine humanity, capable of co-creating a wholly new way of doing everything. And that doesn't mean it's not going to be a dreadful process. It, dark nights are dreadful, but there's a tremendous hope. And the hope is the birth of a new way of being and doing and a new kind of body and a new kind of humanity. That's the hope. And that hope has been realized by very great spiritual adepts. But now is the time for its realization on a mass scale because it's the real meaning of the crisis. So when you say serve the growing Christ, you've got your marching orders, but you've also got your focus. You serve the growth of this new being of love and compassion and courage and generosity in yourself. You serve it in other people that you have the honor to talk to, like I'm talking to you and talk with, like I'm talking with Sandy. And you serve it in the world because you see that institutions can either go to darkness or reflect light of justice and compassion. So you work politically to ensure that they remain vehicles of justice and true change and you serve the birth of this new humanity because you know from the great evolutionary mystics that if matter is transformed in the human then it will be trans it will ripple out there'll be a massive mysterious transformation of matter throughout the universe that's the <laughs> many even scientists are speaking about this now so once you know that, your life is flooded with purpose and joy, whatever is happening. And you know that your life is about giving everything that you are and have and can to the birth. Whatever happens to me, I know that I've spent my life giving everything I have and know and care about to the birth. That's, I, that's what I know about myself. And that doesn't make me vain, I hope, but it makes me joyful. It makes me know that I every day I live for a true purpose. Yeah. And the deep meaning of the book, Radical Regeneration, is to help you get to that true purpose, to realize, yes, it's going on. No, we don't know how it's going to work. We don't know how terrible it's going to be or not be. It probably will be very, very scary. Don't get scared. Get down with the deep, sacred work. Find your true self and give everything constantly away and you'll live a joyful life in the middle of absolute madness. That's always been the way. As an elder, um, when you look at the young people, the new generations, um, oh, yeah. do you feel hopeful? Yes. That they are leaving <laughs> yes. it in good hands. <laughs> Well, I feel unbelievably overjoyed at some of the young people I meet, yeah. the amazing women that are emerging out of this 40 years of feminism, these, the new women who are really so 
mature and funny and incredibly intelligent and aware of all of the cruel, subtle ways in which we deform the feminine. I'd learned so much from them. And I'm amazed at the young men who have really gotten over, oh, how many homophobia, misogyny, I mean, they're really adorable and loving and open and kind and amazingly masculine and amazingly feminine at the same time. There's a new male appearing. Mm. And I hope that the one thing I don't know is whether the ways in which we learn things will be helpful to them. I, I, I'm still trying as hard as I can to try and give some of what I know to them because I know it's going to be valuable to them. But they don't usually read books. They, they learn in different ways and finding ways that they don't find um, ridiculous or soaked with the language of the past. That's very hard. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and pray and do it because... The Dalai Lama has written an incredible book called The Call for Revolution, which he wrote for the young when he was 80. And it's a, filled with hope because he says, I am just overwhelmed with how much progress you've made, how much courage you have, how much beauty is still radiant in you. So I trust you with all my heart. And I do myself. That's why I dedicate the whole book as where Carol and, I, Carol and I dedicate the whole book to Greta Thunberg and to all the young people who will really be the stewards of this great transition. Mm. Andrew Harvey, thank you so much for adding your 10 best list to the No Beer Spiritual Book oh, Club Library of Recommendations. My great pleasure. Lovely, lovely to be with you, Sandy. What a joy. Thank you, Andrew. Radical you. Regeneration, A Sacred Activism and the Renewal of the World by Andrew Harvey and Carolyn Baker is part of the Sacred Planet book collection published by Inner Traditions. For more mm -hmm. information about the book, Andrew Harvey's work and the Institute for Sacred Activism, visit andrewharvey.net. That's it for this week. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and I'll be back at the same time next week with another 10 best interview for the No BS Spiritual Book Club. Till then, it's goodbye from me, and thank you to Andrew Harvey. Bless you, darling. Thank you. <laughs>